Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, for many, is synonymous with tabletop role-playing games. And thus, many think that the complexity of the D&D rule system is the default for these style of games. Or many think that this complexity is what makes the system good. But I would argue that most people like simplicity. And I would argue that simpler systems are, in a vacuum, better. And I will prove it to you with this. Hello and welcome. My name is Cole Porter. This is Deck of DM Things, and here we explore all the most interesting topics in tabletop role-playing games and adjacent nerdy things. Like the video and subscribe to the channel for more stuff like this, and remember to click the bell if you don't want to miss any future videos from this channel. And today we're doing a comprehensive review of Tiny Dungeon's 2nd Edition. Now, Tiny Dungeon is built on the Tiny Dice system and is written by Alan Barr. Alan Bear. Alan, last name spelled B-A-H. <laughs> Tiny Dungeon 2nd Edition is an exceptionally rules-light system that prioritizes flexibility and efficient gameplay. This simplistic approach means that you spend a lot more time actually playing and advancing the narrative and a lot less time leafing through rules books or scrolling through forums. And Tiny Dungeon, as you'd probably guess from the name, is built for classic fantasy adventures. Essentially, anything you can imagine doing in Dungeons & Dragons or a similar TTRPG, you could do here in Tiny Dungeon 2e as well. So let's start with the core mechanic of the game and a somewhat startling revelation to any dice goblins that may be watching. Tiny Dungeon only uses one type of die, and with the exception of adding or subtracting health points, there is no math involved in this game. At all. And this boils down to the most basic rule of the game, which is called a test. A test is anything that a character attempts to do that isn't guaranteed to succeed or guaranteed to fail. For the sake of comparison, it's essentially the same thing as anything could roll a d24 in Dungeons & Dragons. Skill checks, saving throws, and attack rolls. But instead of a d20 in Tiny Dungeon, you roll the poor man's polyhedral. That's right, d6s. Standard test has a player rolling 2d6 by default, though you could have advantage or disadvantage that gives you 3d6 or 1d6 respectively. To determine whether or not you succeed, you simply look at the dice that you rolled, and if you see a 5 or a 6, you have succeeded. If you don't see either of those things, then you have failed. That's it. That's as simple as it is. The same rule applies for save tests, which are meant to avoid some kind of threat. Like jumping out of the way of an out-of-control cabbage cart or trying not to pass out in an ale-chugging competition. Again, you roll your test with 2d6 as a default, and if you see a 5 or a 6, then you've passed. And you don't get hit by the cabbage cart or, or throw up in the competition or, or fall into the trap. You know. The big takeaway from the test mechanic, though, is that it is simple. It is efficient. But again, if you think this sounds too simple and you're like me and the first time you're hearing this, you think there's no way that a well fleshed out system with a lot of customization and strategic decision making could be built on something so simple. Watch and see, this gets really, really good. At least in my opinion. And let me know if you disagree. Let's talk about Combat. Combat starts with an initiative test. This is used to determine the order in which every character's or combatant's turns take place. And how is an initiative test rolled? Well, because it's a test the same way as any other test in this system. You simply roll 2d6. If you succeed on the test, then you get to go before the enemies. If you fail on the test, you get to go after them. That's it. You've rolled for initiative. Good job. Then once combat begins, you start working through the initiative order and every combatant gets to take its turn. On your turn, you can take two actions. You can use each action to do a number of things like attack, evade, focus, move, or something something else. When you use your action to attack, you get to test 1d6 for weapons that you're not proficient with, 2d6 for weapons that you are, and if you've mastered a weapon, you get to test with 3d6, essentially attacking with advantage. If you succeed on the test, you do damage. If you fail on the test, you do not. And when we discuss traits later on, you can see how this can actually get fairly strategic. There are three categories of weapons. There are light weapons, which deal one damage or held in one hand and can be used to attack with both of your turn's actions if you want. Heavy weapons deal two damage, are held in two hands, but attacking with a heavy weapon can be your only attack action that turn. Your other action is still free to be used for something else, like using an object or moving. Heavy weapons can also have a longer reach than light weapons, but suffer disadvantage if you're hitting something that's a bit further out than five feet. Range weapons, of course, can be fired from a distance, but do have disadvantage on enemies that are close by. Range weapons must also be reloaded, and reloading also takes an action. If you want an easy way to manage 
manage ammo in Tiny Dungeon, they provide an optional rule called cinematic ammunition. With this rule, every player that fired a ranged weapon during combat will roll a test at the end of combat. On a fail, the weapon is now out of ammo until they do something to refill it. I personally really like this because it allows you to not really worry about tracking ammunition, but still provides an opportunity for you to run out. And I think that's a fun and important thing for someone using ranged weapons. Besides attacking, you can also use an action to evade. Once you evade until the start of your next turn, every time an enemy hits you, you make a 1d6 test. On a success, you evade the attack and take no damage. Or you can use an action to focus, which is kind of like the inverse of evade. The next time you attack after focusing, but before combat ends, your test is successful on a 4, 5, or 6, making the chances of hitting much, much higher. You can also make a regular ability check during combat, like trying to climb a wall, kissing an enemy combatant on the lips, or giving an ally an awkward high five. And of course, you can use your action to move. And you should just assume that every character has a speed of 25 feet. That means in a single turn, they could use both their actions to move 50 feet, one action to move 25, or if they're using both their actions for something else, they stay in place. However, if you prefer to play in the uh, <clears throat> theater, of the mind, Tiny Dungeon has what's called a range rule. Essentially, they break down the relative position of any creature or object to any other between close, near, or far. Each range has their own implication for combat and interactions, but all you really need to know is it makes it simpler if you don't have a visual representation of where everything is and where everyone's going. Note that in Tiny Dungeon, there is no armor stat. There's no armor class. Instead, there's only HP. If HP is lost, a character can restore their HP by sleeping for six hours. If they don't make the full six hours, they get one HP per hour rested. If your HP drops to zero, you're now dying and you have two chances to save yourself with a save test. If you pass on either of the tests, you come up with one HP. If you fail on both the tests, however, well, lucky for you, character creation is very easy. Let's talk about that now. Now that we've covered the base mechanics of the game and combat, let's talk about the character creation itself. We should start by noting that characters in Tiny Dungeon 2nd Edition don't have a class and they don't have a race. Instead, they have a heritage, a set of traits, and a weapon group all chosen by the player. Players are also encouraged to select a family trade and a belief, but that's more for flavor and for roleplay than it is for actual mechanics. If you're curious why Tiny Dungeon uses the word heritage instead of race, this is what they write. I think it's worth reading, so feel free to pause the video and read it, because I think more systems should do this. Now, when it comes to heritages, there are eight you can choose from. You have the human, fey, dwarf, goblin, salamar, which are humanoid salamanders, tree folk, karu, or karhu, or something like that. Either way, they're humanoid bears, and lizard folk. In addition to determining your starting HP, each heritage has its own unique heritage traits as well. For example, Fae, which are basically elves, start with 6 HP and the Bow Mastery trait. This fate gives all Fae mastery with bows, allowing them to attack with advantage when using them. Goblins, on the other hand, start with only 4 HP, but have goblin agility. This essentially means they always have evade active, allowing them to test to dodge every single attack that comes at them. You can see how they balance a low HP with this trait. And then after you choose your heritage, you can now choose three traits. Traits are a lot like feats in Dungeons and & Dragons, and the traits you choose combined with the heritage of your character really determines their capabilities. And because there's no limitation on which traits can be combined with which or with which heritage, there is actually a tremendous amount of variation you can have between characters. And when it comes to the traits themselves, there are enough to justify having a video just to cover those. But for now, let's look at a few highlights. Berserker, you can choose to attack with disadvantage and get plus one to the damage dealt. Brawler, while fighting unarmed, the evade action tests with 2d6 instead of 1d6. Eidetic Memory, when testing to recall information that you've seen or heard before, you succeed on a test with a four, five, or six, not just a five or six. Quick Shot, you are able to reload and fire a ranged weapon with the same action, tough you gain an additional two HP. Then we have two traits that'll be a nice segue into our magic system. You have Spell Reader, which allows you to read and use magic scrolls with a successful test. And you have Spell Touch, which allow you to subtly influence the world around you by merely willing it to happen. So now let's talk about that magic system. 
Tiny Dungeon 2nd Edition has a very flexible but very open-ended magic system. This can be great or terrible depending almost entirely on the players and on the Dungeon Master. For example, characters with the Spell Reader trait can read magic scrolls that can be found or purchased in your game world. Spell Readers are limited because they can only cast spells on scrolls that they have and those scrolls are consumed when they use them. This means those characters will need a consistent way to get scrolls that are fun and unique if they want this trait to be worth their while. That puts a lot of weight on the Game Master, and some Game Masters would love this. I would love this because you get to make up spell effects. You can have a discount spell scroll store. You can have uh, spell scrolls hidden away in different dungeons. This could be excellent quest fodder to go find a scroll of resurrection or of long distance teleportation, or even a scroll of instant death or a scroll of diarrhea. I don't know, have fun with it. Of course, there are ways to shift this burden to the player by allowing them to request or perhaps even commission different spell scrolls. Spell-touched characters, on the other hand, don't have resources they need to cast their spells, but their spells can't be too powerful. They can move small objects, make illusory effects, or light and extinguish a small flame, stuff like that. They can, however, use spells in combat, treating them just like a ranged attack with a 2d6 test, but they don't have to reload, which is nice. I really like this flexibility. It makes the characters feel truly magical that they can harness their limited energy to kind of manifest in whatever way they want. And for spell raiders, the idea that they could harness or release any magical effect provided they find the right scroll is also really exciting in a weird way. There are other traits that are also considered magical, like Beast Speaker and Familiar, and even Healer to a certain extent is also considered a type of magic. But those are all pretty cut and dry as far as how they apply mechanically to the game. So that is our deep dive into Tiny Dungeon 2nd Edition. If you've watched this far, first of all, hats off to you, my friend. Please let me know in the comments if you're hearing me say this right now, and I'll give you a little winky face emoji down there, and everyone will wonder what made you special. And all along, it was just who you are. You're you're just great. But I would also just like to hear your thoughts in the comments in general. We only really looked at the player perspective into this. If you want to talk more about the role of the Game Master in Tiny Dungeon or in other systems, please let me know what you're interested in hearing. And in the meantime, thank you for watching and have an excellent day.